Let's now talk about how we can generalize our sets that can hold things other than integers. Uh, and before we can do that, we need to talk just a little bit about binary, not much. So I'll start by reviewing the decimal number system, which you know quite well. Uh, so we have 10 digits in decimal 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Uh, and we represent larger numbers, that is larger than 9, by creating sequences of digits. So for example, there's a trick that we use where if we want to represent the, the number 7,091, uh, we write 7091. And how this works is, and you know this is second nature to you, but it is actually quite clever and not obvious, uh, is that we need to, uh, the interpretation of the digits is as follows. The rightmost digit is just as it says. This means the number has, uh, well, one in it. Uh, but when we move towards the left, each one of them, when we get to this nine, it's implicitly, we treat it as implicitly 10 times as large as this digit, right? Uh, so in a sense, we are multiplying nine by 10. Uh, zero, well, it's a zero, so who cares? And then seven. Well, this seven up here doesn't represent just seven more of something. It represents 7,000 somethings. Uh, and what does that mean? Well, I take my base, 10, and because this is a third digit from the right, I multiply by 10 to the third, okay? So that's uh, the familiar decimal number system. And I bring this up because we're gonna do something very similar in binary, right? So in binary, by contrast, instead of having 10 digits, we only have two. We have zero and one. And just like in decimal, if I wanna represent something larger than one, then I need sequences of digits. So for example, the number 1110, and this right here uh, means base two, this is a binary number. If I want to convert this to base 10 to our familiar numbers, I want to understand what this binary number represents. Well, what I can do then is say, okay, well, this is really just uh, the same deal, except now our base is two instead of 10. And so each of these digits are gonna count as, uh, so this one's zero, just like, it's just exactly what it says. But this one's actually twice as big as it looks, and four times as big as it looks, and eight times as big as it looks. So that in effect, if I wanted to convert this thing to uh, decimal, then I need to add uh, two to the third, plus two squared, plus two to the first. So comparing it to what we did before, uh, the base 10 number, 7091, the top digit was multiplied by 10 to the third, because it's the third digit from the right. And just so here, the third digit from the right uh, will multiply by two to the third instead of 10 to the third. And so if we add these digits up, eight plus four plus two, that tells us that this binary number is 14, okay? And we'll discuss this later in the course in a little more detail, but that's all you need to know for today. So if I have, for example, a bunch of base 10 numbers, here are their corresponding binaries, and you can enjoy the process of converting any of these base twos uh, to base 10, okay? And as a bonus, if you want, uh, here's the base eight table. Uh, so basically all this is saying is that the number 8 in base 10 is the number 10 in base 8, which is the number 1000 in base 2, or binary. Okay, so why is this useful to us today? Well, <clears throat> let's consider a larger example. Suppose we have this 32-bit binary number. So if I want to know what this represents <clears throat> in base 10, then I need to sum the 2nd, 4th, 5th, 10th, and 11th powers of 2. This digit is so far to the left that it actually represents two to the 11th times as much stuff, so to speak. All right, so to do that, well, we add two to the 11th plus two to the 10th plus two to the fifth plus, uh-oh, one to the fourth. Err, let's fix it. Okay. Do, do, do. okay. Spoilers. All right, so uh, two to the 11th, two to the 10th, two to the fifth, two to the fourth, two to the square. And so we add all these up, uh, we get 2048, plus 1,024, plus 32, plus 16, plus four, and finally we end up with 3,124. So this sequence of digits is 3,124. Okay, I still don't see what that has to do with the class earlier. Ah, well here we'll bring it all back. Okay. Remember our goal was we wanted to represent not just numbers in our sets, but anything. So we can play a trick to take any data we have and turn it into a binary number. Okay. So for example, <clears throat> Suppose we want to store lowercase words instead of integers. What would that mean? Okay. What we could do is take any particular word and convert it to a unique integer representation. So for example, we could say, okay, well, the word cat, right? Well, the word cat, um, we could just say C is the third letter of the alphabet, A is the first letter of the alphabet, and T is the 20th letter of the alphabet. So in other words, look, here's C, and this is the number three in binary, one plus two, three. Uh, A is the first letter in the alphabet. 
T is the 20th letter in the alphabet. That's 16 uh, plus 4. And so what I can do then is cram each letter. I'm kind of playing a trick, right? I'm just saying, OK, well, I have a three letter word, so I'll just use these five bits for the leftmost letter, the middle letter, the rightmost letter. And in a sense, then, I'm representing the word cat by this sequence of digits, which, as we saw in the previous slide, is just 3,124. And so I could play this trick with the words cat, dog, potato, snack, and I'll get different integers. And so if I'm using a data indexed word set that's based on this principle, then whenever I say put cat, I first compute this number, and then I go to that box and I set it to true. Okay? Uh, and so in this way, I'm able to store the word cat. And as long as I have code that knows how to turn cat into a number, then I'm in good shape. Uh, so how about longer strings? right? So there's an issue, obviously. If I have 32 bits, uh, then, well, I can't cram more letters. If I have like a 100-letter word, uh, it's not going to fit. And we'll talk about how to deal with that. I and mean, I guess I should say, why 32 bits? Well, it turns out that in Java, an integer is 32 bits. So if we're going to be using the same code we did before in our previous example in the last video, um, in that case, you know, that's what we're stuck with, 32 bits. Okay? So let's suppose then uh, we have longer strings. Uh, well, one thing we could do is have a maximum string and just say, OK, you can't get longer than something. Uh, but we also have ambiguity, like a hothead, you know, an angry person, uh, would, <clears throat> as it turns out, have the exact same numerical representation as pothead, which is different. That's not somebody who's particularly angry, but instead someone who smokes a lot of weed. Uh, so here is um, basically the reason that comes up. So this is hothead. And it turns out that both P and H, the bottom two bits of it, are 0. Uh, and so there's just nowhere to put the information about H versus P. So this could be hothead, pothead, hothead. Uh, there you go. Those numbers, uh, all of those words will index to the same position here. OK? Uh, and so we'll talk about ways we can resolve this. Uh, but first, before we do that, OK, because that's going to be a thing we have to deal with, um, First, let's talk about how we even just implement this basic thing before we talk about how to fix this issue. Okay. Uh, so what would insert look like? right? So again, I'm ignoring these annoying issues. We'll come back to them in the next segment. But here, if we just were willing to tolerate this ambiguity, uh, then it might look something like this. So when I insert a particular string, I first convert it to an integer, and I set that position to true. And then whenever I do contains, uh, I would first convert that string to an integer and then just return that item. Okay. And yes, there's some ambiguity, because here if I insert hothead and then I check contains pothead, it will say true. Okay? But yeah, that's something we'll fix soon. Uh, and what does convert to int look like? Well, this is a bit more than what I really care about in lecture, but I've just put it here for uh, if you really want to see it. Uh, it might look like this. I have a string. So I iterate through the string, uh, and I first take whatever bits I have already, and I move them over by five bits. Okay? So this operator, we haven't talked about it in our class. But it means take the current number and shift everything over by five bits. Uh, and this says add the representation of that particular letter. Okay. Uh, so this right here goes letter by letter and inserts them into one big integer. Uh, and this code right here takes a single letter uh, and it turns it into an integer representation, a five bit integer representation. Now, this is a little intricate, though. Again, I don't expect you to understand this code. And I'm providing it simply as a reference for those of you who really want it. Okay. So <clears throat> we have two. This actually, maybe I should back up a little. This is the most important part, right? Understand that there exists some convert to int function. And if you really want, you can look into this convert to int function. But the particulars here on this slide are not very important. OK. So those are our fundamental challenges. Uh, sorry, <laughs> why did I? Yeah. The two fundamental challenges are, one, how do we resolve ambiguity? Gross pie and boss pie. Those are the same thing, right? You don't want to mix up a gross pie with a totally boss pie. Uh, and so we'll call that issue, dealing with that um, feature of our data structure to be collision handling. And then the other question is, how do we convert arbitrary data to an index, right? So I came up with this crazy scheme right here, uh, where I basically take each letter and I turn it into five bits. But there are other possibilities. Uh, and so there are better ones than one I came up with. And we'll call this process of taking a piece of data and turning it into an integer as computing a hash code. Okay. For strings, that was relatively straightforward. We just said, OK, let's treat it as a big base 32 number and copy some letters to certain positions. Um, but we had some issues. We had a maximum string length. And we'll see that uh, 
there are better ways of hashing strings uh, or computing the hash code of a string. Uh, and also we'll see that when we want to do something like, let's say you have a gigantic table of data and you wanted to compute a hash code, uh, we can still do it. Okay. Now actually I'll make a note, which is that uh, in the object class, there is a method called hash code and Java, by the way, requires that every single object has that method. Every object has to know how to turn itself into an integer, though there is a default hash code if you haven't, um, uh, if you have not yourself implemented it. Because you know, whenever you guys made, say, planet stock Java, it was required. Java requires that each planet knows how to turn itself into an integer. You guys didn't write one, and it turns out it used the default one. And so we'll talk more about hash codes later. But these are the two challenges. How do we deal with things that might have the same um, hash code, we'll call it? Uh, and the other is, how do you compute the hash codes, period?